Wally, I am super pumped to have you on the show today. Uh, you are guest number three in our Millionaire series. Uh, and I know that the audience is going to learn so much about uh, you and your journey to the millionaire status. So I already told the audience a little bit about you, but I'd love it if you could just kind of break down, you know, a little bit more about yourself. So, you know, where are you from? How did you grow up? What did your parents do? Give us the rundown. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I hope I'm pretty interesting, but um, my name is Wally and I'm actually a financial coach now. I help people, mainly millennials and Gen Zers who kind of figured out the college thing, who kind of figured out like, I got a career, uh, but this money hole situation I'm stuck with. I don't know what to do with budgeting, saving and investing. So um, that is sort of where my focus is now. Now, although I am a money nerd and I love my spreadsheets, I wasn't all always that way. I essentially spent my 20s making good money, but spending every single dollar that I earned. And some of that came from things that I learned directly from my parents and some things that I learned indirectly from my parents um, because conversations around money wasn't normal, right? It was pretty Mm -hmm. taboo. Um, I'm a first generation college graduate. I'm a daughter of an immigrant, um, born and raised in New York City, actually raised in the poorest borough of the city, which is the Bronx. So, you know, the conversations and the feeling around money was very different um, from what it is today, or at least my environment today. And so, yeah, some of these conversations felt uncomfortable and also unrelatable. When people mm-hmm. talked about building wealth, I was like, what the heck is that? Like, that's rich, right? Like you have to be an athlete or an actor or, you know, like somebody famous. And I wasn't going to be any of those things. So in my mind, I was never going to be quote unquote rich, or I wasn't going to be wealthy. And I equated rich and wealthy to mean the same thing. Ooh, so we're already getting into the gyms here. So rich and wealthy are not the same. Tell us, tell us how they're different to you. Yeah. So my definition originally was, you know, you had the mansions, the fancy cars, the private jet flights, right? That's what it meant to be rich. That's what it meant to feel financially secure. That's what it meant to be wealthy. Um, And really, I needed to sort of define that word wealth. And that word wealth, that term was very foreign to me. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't Again, because I equated it with the amount of money you had, I couldn't relate to it until I started taking apart. I took I set aside the financial aspect of it Mm. and meant what did it mean to live a rich life? Like, what did it mean to be wealthy when it came to my spirit, when it came to my relationships, when it came to, you know, the thing, the life that I wanted to live? Right. I felt like I had a very full life when I was traveling. I felt like I had a really full life when I was laughing with friends. And so I sort of had to define what wealth meant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now, even when I meet with my clients, what I tell them is it's great to set these financial milestones. Absolutely. But what I really want to hear is what your lifestyle goals are. Like, let's, let me know what it is that you value, what's most important to you. And then we could align Um, how you're spending, how you're saving, how you're building wealth with that, right? So it's like, okay, let's meet the the lifestyle goals. And then we'll just use money as a tool to build that for you. If you are a regular listener, I want to tell you, I'd never met Wally before. So um, you just said so many of the things that I frequently say. So money is a tool to help you live the life that you want. And it's so important to align your spending with your values. Uh, yeah. So let's keep, let's keep the party rolling. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about childhood and, you know, kind of memories that you had that you mentioned growing up in the poorest of the boroughs. I did not know that the Bronx was the poorest of the boroughs, but um, you know, what was it like? Did you have a piggy bank? Was there ever an allowance? Um, did you get a job like pretty early on? Uh, what other things kind of stand out about childhood money memories that you have? Yeah. So I wouldn't equate that I lived in poverty or that I was, you know, that we were very poor. Like we didn't have enough food to eat. We always had food on the table. It may not have been what I wanted. Right. But we always had food on the table and we had a roof over our head. 
but there were certain things that happened. So for example, we only got one pair of shoes and one pair of sneakers every school year, right? There wasn't this option of like when the new trend came out that I can go and buy the latest pair of Jordans. Like I had to, you know, like I never owned a pair of Jordans, you know, <laughs> um, while I was, while you know, while I was a kid, right? That just was unfathomable. I'm also one of five children, mm-hmm. right? So there was a lot of, I was lucky that I was the oldest. So I didn't really have hand-me-downs, but like the younger kids had hand-me-downs, right? Um, I remember, you know, writing a list of things of, of what I wanted for Christmas and, you know, getting like one of those things. And now when I think back of it, sometimes it was that like the least expensive of those things, right? So, you know, I definitely had all of the things that I absolutely needed, but some of those wants weren't always, you know, I just, there was just no money for that. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think part of my personality is just to kind of conform to like the environment around me. So I think it just came to a point where I just really wouldn't ask for a whole lot. I was pretty, I would say I was pretty satisfied with that. Now, when we talk about, you know, like the conversations we had around money, we didn't really have conversations around money. So it was like things that I would pick up that I would hear my parents say like, oh, they're going to shut off the, the turn off the light today if we don't pay this amount. Or, you know, the if we had cable at the time, it was like, OK, well, we don't have cable now <laughs> because right. the light was paid. So it was like all of like these little things. And so I knew that money wasn't well, to me, it felt like money wasn't abundant, right? Um, That we had to sort of live within um, a budget and we had to really focus on the things that were really important. And I'm going to fast forward that a little bit because how that translated into my 20s was that I began making really good money. And so I knew to pay my bills, right? Make sure that light doesn't get turned off. Make sure my cell phone is is still turned on. So I was really good at paying um, my bills. The one thing that I, you know, I made a mistake in thinking was that I was good with money because I didn't have credit card debt. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't that I was overspending, right? I wasn't spending more than I made. But like once I paid my bills, I said, okay, all this money that I have left over, I can like spend on whatever. And so I did. So I went, you know, I was eating out a lot and I was buying a lots of clothes and lots of shoes. And some of that came from like as a kid, not having the options <laughs> of clothing and shoes. And so I really wanted to make up for it. And so when I looked around, when I'm like, okay, where did I spend all my money on? If I looked at my my bank statements basically was saying, if I, you know, we talk about what you spend your money on is like what you value most. Like what I was saying was that I valued all these clothes and these shoes. And it was really from that, you know, trying to make up for like, I didn't have this as a kid. Like I only had like two pair of jeans and like four shirts. Right. So now I wanted all the jeans, all the shirts, all the things. (laughs) And it was just like, you know, spend, 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 because I didn't know what to do with extra money. I think you bring up a really good point about the idea that like you get some money nugget and you kind of hold on to that one thing and you're just like, I'm good. And uh, so frequently with my clients as well that I I hear, well, I don't have any credit card debt. So I'm I'm in pretty good financial shape, Um, but they, they don't have any savings and they don't realize that there are other aspects, you know, that not having debt is a great thing, but there are also savings. There's also investing. There's also, you know, all these different buckets of being able to optimize your finances And so simply checking one box, but some people don't have a litmus test or anything to measure that by. They don't realize that, you know, they're not doing a great job or a plus plus job because they've only heard about this one thing like, oh, debt is bad. I don't have debt. I'm doing good. Like super simple. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, sort of like an aha moment that I had, there was two. Mm -hmm. And one was I, I was maybe 28 or 29 years old and I got, I don't think they even mail these out anymore, but when I was 28, 29, I received in the le- in the mail a letter from the Social Security Administration, and it was basically an earnings, in, you know, like an earnings statement from like all the jobs that I had ever had. So I had like my job when I was like 14 or 15 years old working youth, you know, uh, working in summer youth camps and things like that, those summer youth jobs um, to like, you know, all the money that I had made, you know, out of college. And I remember adding up that amount of money. And that was like, holy crap, like, where did all this money go? Mm -hmm. And that was sort of like my first 
whoa, like something is not matching up here. And that was like realizing like how much money I had made. And I would really recommend if you've never taken a look at this statement, you can get it for free at the, what is it? SSA.gov website at the Mm -hmm. social security administration website, you know, just enter your information and you can see all of your earnings from like any time you've paid like social security, right. Um, That's been pulled out of your paychecks. And that was sort of like an eye opening moment. Like, okay, I don't have a lot to show for the amount of money that I made. So that was like number one. The second aha moment that I had was I actually graduated from college and had a really was able to find a career and a job that I really loved and enjoyed. I worked at every organization that I worked for. I loved my coworkers. I love the work, right? So you already know where this is going because I see you're smiling, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, like I was like, wow, like I'm blessed. Like this is awesome, you know? And then things changed. And so uh, one of my jobs, one of the places that I worked, I loved everybody there. I loved the work we were doing. Of course, it was challenging. There were ups and downs, but it was a really great place to work until one of my supervisors left. And when that happened, there was a change in management and a very like ideal workplace essentially became a very toxic work environment. Mm. And so it went from like a bad week to like a bad month to like a bad quarter. And I was just like, oh my goodness. And I realized, you know, there were days that I just wanted to say, I quit. And I'm like, if I quit, I won't eat and my mortgage won't get paid. And like, I won't pay everything that I worked so hard for. It's going to be gone. And I realized like, I didn't have a lot of choices and I didn't have financial freedom. Right. I didn't, I was tied to this nine to five and, you know, I did have a little bit of money in savings, so maybe I would be okay if I missed one paycheck, but if I missed two paychecks, that was it. And I sort of thought back to how much money I had made throughout my whole career, right? Even from like back in my old high school jobs. And I realized like, I'm missing something here. Like this is just not adding up. And that was sort of my second aha moment that I needed to do something different. I love it. I love it. I love it. This idea of like something happens in life. Um, everything's plugging along as planned. And then all of a sudden, like, er, like something is going to get, you're always going to be throwing a curveball in life and how to yeah. prepare for those things. You know, sometimes we're, we're just not prepared, but they can be that rude awakening. They can be that lesson so that you can say like, okay, I don't want to end up in this situation again. I do want to circle back for a second to uh, college. So you talked about like finishing college and getting this job. What was the conversation like in deciding to go to college or was, was there, you know, cause that's a money conversation. That's a pretty big deal for a lot of young professionals now, you know, how, how are we going to pay for this thing? Um, and I know you mentioned like having five siblings. So there's a lot of colleges to be paid for. What was that like having that conversation and making that decision for yourself? Oh, wow. I don't even know that I have talked about this before, but one of the the things that happened was I didn't even know what I was supposed to be doing in high school to prepare for college. Mm -hmm. Right. I mentioned that I was like a first generation college graduate. And, you know, when we think about like generational wealth and when we think about that, I also include like generational wealth when it comes to like knowledge and information. Right. There's like this institutional knowledge that doesn't get passed down to the next generation if your parents have never experienced college. So my parents couldn't help me and tell me, oh, you have to take the PSATs and the SATs and you have to fill out this form called the FAFSA, you know? And so really what I was doing was kind of observing what other people my age and my classmates were doing. And I kind of like followed along with them. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember hearing some people say, oh yeah, my mom filled out the financial aid form. Well, I couldn't have my mom, like she didn't even know like what a computer was, you know, or like (laughs) how to use a mouse. So I was like, oh, your mom filled out a financial aid form. So I'm like, okay. You know, I think back then it was like Yahoo. Right. (laughs) Right. It was like, what is a financial aid form? Exactly. Uh, What is a financial aid form? And so I sort of like, was just kind of paying attention to see what other people were doing. And at that time, I didn't even realize like that college was going to like how much college would cost. But I was like, okay, there's this program that will help you pay for college. 
Um, and I remember applying for schools. And I think back now, because I'm like, I know that you have to pay application fees. And I'm like, I don't know how I even got the money to pay those application fees. Like I did have, you know, I think I worked at Burger King for a little while. So I'm like, maybe I just used my Burger King money to pay for those application fees. Today, I know that there's programs and fee waivers and things like that, that one could apply for. But I don't think I knew that at the time. And so trying to even come up with the money to like register for these things that I needed applying for colleges, like is kind of beyond me. One story that I have is uh, the, I was living in Florida at the time. So I moved to Florida when I was 16 and I stayed there for four years. Um, so I was living in Florida at the time. So my dream school was the University of Florida. Like that's where I wanted to go. And so I knew ah! I'm a hurricane. <laughs> Ah, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> uh, but, you know, so uh, the University of Florida was like the school that I wanted to go to. And I remember like, I must have read somewhere that you're supposed to go visit the school and tour the campus. Now, again, my mom is at this point, my mom and dad had separated or they were living separately. My my dad was in in New York and my mom was living in Florida with all of us kids. And I wanted to go tour this campus because that's what you were supposed to do. And so my mom couldn't go like she's working. She has five kids, you know, and I saved some money and I rented like this sketchy motel. So could you imagine like the <laughs> 17 year old like rented this sketchy motel and I took my little putt putt car and I was living like four hours away from Gainesville, like driving there. And I remember going to like the first day of orientation of like, you know, the tour and like all of these parents with their kids and they're asking questions. I didn't even know what questions to ask. Mm. Right. Like I, I just I didn't know. And I remember being like awestruck by like this beautiful football field. I wasn't even a football fan at the time. But, you know, I was just like, you know, I was just so impressed by this campus and this football field and all this stuff. And I just felt so out of my element. Mm. And even though I wanted to be there, like there was a part of me that was like, but you don't belong here, you know? Ooh. And it was, um, it was, you know, like I walked away feeling like excited, but like really nervous and self-conscious. Right. Because I'm like, girl, like, even though we were living in Florida at the time, like at the end of the day, like, I'm like this kid from the Bronx, you know, <laughs> I'm like, I don't know if I really belong here. And, you know, the one conversation that I had with my mom about like my college plans, cause I was like, I'm going to get out of here. You know, I was like tired of like my sisters. I had three sisters. Oh, well, even my brother, like he has curly hair and like, you know, going to use the gel and mousse for my hair and like the bottle being empty I was just like fed up and so I just wanted to leave the house and um I remember saying like I just want to go to Gainesville I'm gonna go to college and my mom said you know like I I want that for you but like I can't I have all these kids you know like I need your help and like I applied for the school I ended up getting waitlisted and again this was my only idea was that this was a school that I wanted to go to. I didn't even think about like, this is why I'm thinking I must have paid for this college application myself because it was the only school that I applied to. Mm. Um, you know, like most people don't do that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it was the only school that I applied to and I got waitlisted. And I remember having the conversation with my mom and kind of feeling guilty, like, but I, I want this for myself, but uh, you know, like, of course I have to help the, her. I'm like the oldest kid. And so I ended up just going to a community college and I went to the community college for two years. And so I went later, you know, afterwards I transferred. Um, and I will say like, it was kind of a blessing in disguise. Like nobody asked me, you know, <laughs> where did you spend your first two years of college? Like the university that I went to, like, that's what people know. Uh, it really allowed me to minimize the amount of student debt that I had, but it was also one of those things where it's just like, what would my life have looked like? You know, what, what would the networks that I had built look like had I gone to a big university? Um, and so, yeah, that was kind of the extent of the college conversation. And um, because I had gotten waitlisted and because my mom had said, you know, like, I'm going to need your help with with the kids, you know, I just decided to stay home. 
Um, I, I love the way the story has played itself out in a way that like, I think so many listeners can relate to the idea that, oh, like, it's not just like a, here's your 529 plan and you go ahead and, and mm. everything is great and you move on. Um, there, there's real things that need to be considered as it pertains to being able to achieve a higher education when money is something that it needs to be taken care of in the household. And there's, you know, multiple people, you know, you're operating as a family unit, you're not operating independently um, and the pressures that come with that. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. So you finished college and what is the plan? Um, are you out on your own? You said you, you, you mentioned a job that you really loved. Did you get that immediately right out of school? And, and that's where we were kind of back in the story. Yeah. So I ended up, uh, finishing my two years of, um, community college and the day of my graduation from like my associate's degree, I got a job offer, um, that was going to sort of started my, my trajectory into the career that I had. Um, and I was super lucky that I got this job offer and I was like, okay, how am I going to make this work? <laughs> because I have two years of school left to do. And so I was willing to make a sacrifice. And the sacrifice that I was willing to make is that instead of trying to get my bachelor's degree in four years, right. That I was like, if I take night classes, weekend classes and go to school in the summer, like I might be able to finish in like two and a half years. And that was what I ended up doing. I didn't want to just quit college. And actually the job was kind of contingent that I finished college. Oh. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, uh, so I uh, decided to do that. I ended up getting into the criminal justice um, um, field and the legal field. And my goal was always to go to law school. And I had originally majored in political science, but I did have like this feeling that if I graduated with a degree in political science and decided not to go into uh, the legal field, like what in the world was I going to do with a bachelor's degree in political science? So I ended up switching to being a a business major. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I did that. I was a business major. I went to school nights, weekends summer and graduated with my bachelor's degree after two and a half years. Um, And that was kind of what I did. And I then had the opportunity to come back to New York City, which is where I wanted to go. Um, And I had to move in with my dad because I cannot afford New York City rent. (laughs) And um, because that's a real deal thing. Like New York City, all the time, people are talking about how expensive it is. You know, it's one of the most populated cities in the country. I think maybe the most populated city in the country. But, um, you know, so people are living there. But it's like, how are they living there? Because it's so expensive. Uh, We'll definitely circle back to that at some point because, that's definitely a key piece of like, how do you afford it? And I know you're a New Yorker currently, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm living in the city now. I mean, there's definitely things that, look, at, when I moved back to New York City, the job offer that I got was pay me $30,000 a year. There's no way you're going to be able to like afford an apartment and all the things on $30,000 a year. So, But I was really lucky that I was able to move in with my dad. And he was like, okay, you got to take care of paying the light bill and the cable bill. So like my cost of living was kind of low. Like I was like, okay, good. But that helped me um, to be able to begin saving money. Like so So I began saving some money, putting some money aside, and that ended up uh, really helping me because after living with my dad for a couple of years, I applied for a job out in California. And what helped me make that move was the little bit of money that I had been saving. And of course, I didn't have like furniture or anything to move, Mm -hmm. but just like the logistics of getting Mm -hmm. my first apartment, buying the plane ticket, you know, (laughs) like it helped that little bit of money that I had been saving, I was able to use to now get a job where um, I went from making, you know, like $30,000 to like $70,000. And so I was, you know, 24 years old, moved to California, got a job in the criminal justice field, making $70,000. And this is kind of where my financial troubles kind of started because you would (laughs) think like, oh, you're making all this money, but I was paying my bills. It never occurred to me that I could pay my student loans off faster. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, And 
I essentially was spending more. So, you know, there's this term called lifestyle inflation or lifestyle creep. And it means, you know, essentially that as you earn more money, we tend to begin spending more. We begin to accumulating some costs that uh, that increase as we make more money. And this is what happened to me. And so I started, you know, I put a little bit of money aside. It wasn't that I didn't save anything, Mm -hmm. but it was like compared to the amount of money that I was now making, I should have had much more money than that. And so, um, yeah, so I got this really good paying job and my spending kind of skyrocketed. So is this the job where you were really enjoying the work, you're enjoying the environment Mm -hmm. and then the, the boss left and poop hit the fan? Exactly. So I worked there for several years, loved it until, right, there was a change in management. And I remember seeing sort of a clickbaity article, you know, I, I feel like the Google gods know what you're thinking. Mm-hmm. And it was the, the clickbait article was like how this couple retired in their 30 or in their 40s. And I was like, what? Right. Mm-hmm. Excuse me? What? And that was when I began to sort of some light bulbs started hitting because I said, well, I am saving some money. It wasn't that I wasn't saving anything, but the component that I was missing was that wealth building. Right. And so here we now it's like full circle. And now I had to define like what wealth meant to me. And one of the things that I wanted was more freedom. I wanted to tell my boss, like, screw you, I'm out of here. And I didn't have (laughs) the freedom to do that. I didn't have options. And so as I started reading about their journey and how they did it, my first thing was, well, they're probably making, you know, like software engineers making like, you know, $500,000 a year. Like, of course, you're able to do that. And as I read the article, I realized it was a couple. So it was a married couple and they were making about, um, you know, 60,000 and 50,000. So 110,000 wasn't like huge. Right. And again, I was seven, I was making $70,000 at the time. So I sort of started thinking, okay, like, how are they doing that? And that was when I realized, wow, there's something called a 401k. <laughs> <laughs> And you can build wealth in a 401k. And I didn't have access to a 401k at the time. I had something called the thrift savings plan. So if you're in the military or a federal employee, you might have access to that. And that, you know, when I thought about building wealth, I didn't know how to do it, right? I had no idea how to do it. And that was where little by little, I began to understand compound interest, for example, Mm -hmm. and sort of the magic of like, you don't have to save a hundred thousand dollars. Like you can put your money in certain type of vehicles or accounts that can help you get there so much faster. And so when I began to learn what it meant to like, what, what really a 401k did or what really a thrift savings plan did, that's when it, it helped me sort of organize my thoughts and also a strategy to like, okay, I don't know if I'm going to be able to retire when I'm 40, but like, I definitely don't want to wait till 65. And so that was kind of like where this whole journey started. I love it. So light bulbs are coming on all over the place. Mm -hmm. You're like, hold on, wait a second. There's something I've been missing out on here. There is more to life than earning the paycheck, spending the paycheck. Um, I know that you started a blog eventually. So kind of bring us full circle to what happened now that the light bulbs are coming on and how you got to this millionaire status. Yeah. So I really sort of wanted to understand like, okay, how can I sort of leverage my current income so that I can begin building wealth? And I will say that it took me a couple of years. Like if this wasn't one of, you know, something that happened overnight, one of the things that I really had to evaluate was where was my money going? And so really understanding your numbers is really important because when I made a list of all of my bills, it was saying that I was supposed to have X amount of money left over. And I was like, I never have that money left over. <laughs> like, what are you right. talking about? And so I really had to start paying attention to where my money was going. And I realized that I was spending money on eating out, dining out, delivery, all of these different things. Um, and I needed to rein that in. Now, that didn't mean that I was going to stop eating out, <laughs> but I needed to like go from like eating out five times a week to like, could we cut that down to two? And sort of making these small incremental steps really sort of challenged me to find fun ways of saving money. And so like I got into the whole like couponing thing and that was kind of fun, you know, like, okay, you know what? I just bought like 
12 rolls of toilet paper for like 99 cents, you know? So like I started gamifying the thing, like how are some ways that I can sort of reduce expenses? Now, reducing expenses is just one as- facet of it, right? Like the other side was, is there a way that I can increase income? And for some people, you can't really cut anymore, right? There's no, right. nothing else to cut. And so you have to think, okay, if I can't cut anymore, is there a way that I can bring in more income? Now, during this time, I ended up uh, getting married and that really helped out too. Now, I will say during the first couple of years of my marriage, my husband was still in school. So he he was working, but it wasn't like a full time, (laughs) a full time salary, but that did help. And so that helped accelerate the journey. Now, at this point, I started paying my uh, student loans off as quickly as possible. Um, I had a car note, so I wanted to pay that off because I knew that if I didn't have to pay a student loan and if I didn't have to pay a car note, I could then use that money to save and invest. And so that was kind of where it happened. And so we really got serious, paid off the debt that we had. So I had student loans. I had a car note and my husband had a car note. So we paid off those debts. Um, And then we began using that extra money to start building, uh, start um, contributing more to our workplace retirement accounts. Mm. And that was where we started. And one of the beautiful things there, and of course, your CFP, you know, but like it was mind blowing to me. I was like, well, we're saving more money and we're paying less taxes. <laughs> right. <laughs> and my money like, is oh. growing. Like, <laughs> And my money is growing. And so, you know, at the time, I think that the limit was maybe $16,000 a year for a 401k. So it was like, okay, can we max out one of these 401ks? And then we did that one year and then we did it another year. And our journey really accelerated. I, we started really honing in and getting focused on this in 2016. OK, this wasn't t- 2010 Six years ago, y'all in 2016. And we then started maxing out our 401ks. Then we started making more money. My husband was able to, you know, once he finished school, making more money. And so rather than increasing our lifestyle, we then um, started increasing our, you know, growth, wealth building journey. And we started working on other type of accounts like a Roth IRA and all of those things. And so from 2016 to 2021, we were able to build a $1 million portfolio focused on that. Like this wasn't, you know, real estate. This wasn't like, you know, day trading. This was like using those workplace accounts and, Mm -hmm. Yeah, that 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 was what the journey is. It's not that sexy, <laughs> right? <laughs> but it's super simple. I, I really, really love, um, like you said, the simplicity of it all. Because I think so often we get caught up in narratives, and you know what I've been hearing quite a bit is like passive income, passive income, uh, real estate, real estate, real estate. Like you just mentioned, mm-hmm. um, you know, do this kind of trading, do that, you know all these sort of kind of get rich quick schemes or mm-hmm. get rich quick uh, programs, I will say, cause not everything <laughs> is a scheme per se, um, mm-hmm. but there's, there's a nice slow and steady way. And that's what the majority of America has access to all the time. Not everybody has the time or the, the intellect or the, the even desire to want to do some of the things that are going to allow you to make a lot of money in a really short period of time. And most of those things are something that they require a large investment of time where it becomes like a full-time job. So you can trade one job for this job and maybe make more money doing that job. But are you even interested in that thing? when you could actually just do the job that you already enjoy and love um, and, you know, and also do the saving related to the kind of income that you're earning and, you know, watch your money grow. Yeah. And you know, what's really funny because some people will assume because we were able to save so much, like we began increasing, you know, from like 10% of our income to 15 to 20 right now, we're saving about 45 to 50% of our income. And people are like, wait a minute, you live in New York city. How in the world are you doing that? Are you guys, you know, like both six figure earners? You took the words right out of my mouth. Tell us, tell us how you're doing it. (laughs) Yeah. And it's really because we focused on what was most important to us, right? I will say my husband, he loves like dining experiences and things like that. And he was like, listen, like I'm cool with like giving up Olive Garden and Cheesecake Factory, but like (laughs) I want to continue like a good dining experience. And so we traded those like 
delivery takeouts and things like that to saying, you know what, we're going to go to a really nice restaurant once or twice a month and like savor it and enjoy it and not feel guilty about it. For me, something that was really important to me and that I valued was travel. Like I didn't need to stay at a five-star hotel, but I wasn't going to stay at a hostel. Right. Right. (laughs) And so it was like, how can I go ahead and like travel, explore, experience new cultures and foods and museums and all the things without like breaking the budget. Um, But when we figured out what was most important to us, we were able to cut out all of the other things. Mm -hmm. And I will say one of the benefits of living in a big city, particularly someplace like New York, is there's so many low cost and free things to do. Of course, there's some things that cost a lot of money. Like if you're going to go to a Broadway show, we're talking about a couple hundred dollars, you know, per ticket. But there's also some like really free things to do. Like when we think about how people come and, you know, come to New York City to be a tourist. I'm like, there's so many things to do here. And I've lived in New York City most of my life. And I still, there's some things that I still have never done ever. Um, And so, you know, really figuring out what's most important to you, spend money on the things that are most important to you, but then cut out all of the rest. Mm -hmm. I realized that even though I had all these clothes and shoes and I had all of these options, I essentially wore the same thing over and over again. (laughs) And so I realized like, you know what, like I know what fits my body. I know what type of things I want to wear. Like, even though it looks cute or I might wear it one time, like the cost per wear is too high (laughs) to buy something Mm -hmm. that either is going to sit in my closet with the tags on it or that I will never wear. And so really getting clear and focused on cutting out the, the fluff, right? I like to use this acronym. We need to learn how to cut the fat. And the way I define fat is F-A-T-T, which is Um, cut on food, accommodation, transportation, and taxes, right? If you can sort of figure out how are some ways that you can optimize your food expenses, your accommodation expenses, your transportation, and your taxes, that's when you can really leverage. Like, I don't care about you getting the $3 or $5 latte every day, right? That's not going to move the needle as much as cutting in these other areas. I love it. I love it. So food, um, deciding what you want to eat. We talked about that in a budgeting episode coming up here, Mm -hmm. Uh, accommodation. So I think, you know, we use the word accommodations, but it's not just when you're you're traveling, you know, your accommodations are that roof that you keep over your head on a, Mm -hmm. on a day-to-day basis. So, you know, understanding whether or not you can get a roommate or, you know, do something else to kind of keep your overall living costs low. Um, transportation, I think cars are a big one for so many people, five mm-hmm. or six, seven, eight hundred dollars sometimes as a monthly payment on a car. No. You know, <laughs> can the jalopy car get you from point A to point B uh, the same way that the fancy five hundred dollar a month car can? And, you know, what you said, does it align with your values? Because if something else is something is more important to you and the car is really just a means to get from point A to point B, then why not have the two hundred dollar a month payment or no payment at all? Um, but I also think like some people will say, okay, no, but you want me to drive a jalopy. I'm like, no, you don't have to drive, you know, the car where you're still like raising the window with your, (laughs) with your (laughs) elbows. No, like, but this also means like, like, instead of getting a BMW or Mercedes, like, can you drive like a Honda Accord? Right. Like, okay. Maybe it doesn't have all the, you know, the fancy stuff, but like, it doesn't have to be a beater, right? Like you can still find a way to, to have the things that, you know, fine, we'll get you from A to B, but also, you know, we'll make you feel like a bit confident, right? So I think there's like these extremes, people are like, Oh, well, you just want me to no, like, no, you just need to sort of evaluate, do you want to pay four, five, $600 on a car payment? Or could you do like $200 on a car payment? And will that be able to get you to where you need to go? I love it. Um, you're right. There's like, there's levels to this is what we say. Yes, right? yes, yes. <laughs> Um, so I know one of the other things is that you are, um, on a journey to be completely work optional by January, 2024. Um, so let's talk a little bit about like what that means and the fire movement and yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so, you know, I talked about sort of this clickbait article where it was like, oh, this couple retires when they're 40. And really what I discovered, um, some people call it like a cult, but essentially FIRE stands for Financially Independent Retiring Early. And you can define retire early in the way that you want. I will say I feel like most millennials aren't really like, I'm going to sit on the beach and not do anything. I think really it's about, you know what? I don't want to have to be forced to work until I'm 65 or 70 before I can enjoy my life. How can I do that at 60 or 55 or 50 or 45? And what I learned was that retirement, however you define it, wasn't an age. I had bought into the what society says that, Retirement is the age of 65. And I'm like, hold on a second. It is not an age. It is when you have enough money, enough in assets that it covers your lifestyle. And so there's a couple of things to wait to think about that. My husband and I, as I mentioned, we enjoy our lives. Like we, you know, we, we, um, we go out to eat. We, go, well, I will say the pandemic has sort of. <laughs> <laughs> has changed things, but like we travel, um, you know, normally we take at least three trips every year, at least one international trip. Um, even during the pandemic, we decided to do like more road trips and things like that. So you can sort of define those things are most important to you. But when you are able to reduce how much your day-to-day expenses are, then that nest egg that you need to replenish that is a lot lower. When we moved from California to New York, we had a tiny apartment, 400 square feet. Okay. Like you could like shower and keep your eye on what was on the stove. Like it was a really (laughs) small apartment, but we were paying $2,500 a month for that. Mm -hmm. And so when the opportunity came that we had to make some sacrifices. And one of the the things that we did was my grandmother was very ill and she was living alone and she had a two bedroom apartment. And my husband and I talked about it. We thought about it, but because she sort of needed that. And in our communities, it's not uncommon for like there be intergenerational living. So I was like, how would you feel if like we went in and, you know, like started living with my grandma And so we did that. My grandmother um, has since passed away, but we lived with her for two years. And trust me, there were some challenging times, you know, Um, my grandmother had been living alone for decades. So like learning how to like share space and all of that was difficult, but it also gave us an opportunity to like, you know, rebuild that relationship that I had with her from when I was like a little kid, like I hadn't lived with her or even lived in the city within with her for um, several years. So that was really nice. And um, now we live in the apartment that she owned, right? Mm. She owned the apartment. And so that, that was something that we did. Now that doesn't mean we live rent free because if you you know anything about New York city, you're still paying almost what it costs to rent. Like there's something called maintenance fees and all of this stuff, but it's not $2,500 a month. Mm. And so there were some sacrifices that we did, but Even besides that, I remember when I had, um, I ended up purchasing my first home as a single person before I even met my husband when I was like 28 years old. And what I did was that I had roommates. And so I had two roommates and they paid me to live in my house. Mm. (laughs) And so that was like a really um, you know, I, I will say I had a very fortunate situation that I love the roommates that I had and they lived with me for several years, but I was able to bring in some extra income by like leveraging what I had around me. And so when we think about fire, you know, I've heard of uh, financially independent, retire to real estate, retire to entrepreneurship, retire early, whatever that thing is, it essentially means build a nest egg so that you can do whatever it is that you want. If you want to continue to work, awesome, right? That's why it's called being work optional. But if you don't want to work or want to choose a job that pays way less money, but it's going to be more fulfilling, now you're not relying on a paycheck. So that's essentially what FIRE is. I love it. You did a great job of breaking it down so people can really understand, you know, how you can 
how you can shape it to a way that is uh, synonymous with the way the life that you want to live. Um, and I really like how you talked about the idea of like moving in with your grandma and then also like having roommates. I think that's one of the things that were sometimes like, you know, in your fat, you know, accommodations was that second thing. Um, but ways to get your actual living costs down sometimes requires like saying like, OK, I, I can't live on my own. So, so often it's like I'm grown. I'm going to be on my own. I can't share a space. Absolutely right. <laughs> not. You know, and we get kind of caught up in that. And it's like, if you could even do it for just a li little while, it can be a, a game changer for the trajectory of your finances. And just to really like start thinking outside the box as it pertains to is really, you know, being under the same roof with other people. So terrible that I would rather take a way longer to get to my other financial goals than to, to do this thing. So, um, yeah, I love that you brought that up as a, as a millennial because it's super unpopular. So. Yeah. I, again, I think it's one of those things like be flexible, but also focus. It's not about a life of deprivation, right? Mm -hmm. I am definitely not going to, you know, as I mentioned, like, I know there's people who, and I did this for a while, right? Um, I would stay in hostels. I had no problem doing that, but you know, you come to a certain point, it's just like, all right, I don't know if this is that cool mm -hmm. anymore. So then focus on the things that is really important to me, uh, important to you, um, and then cut out everything else. I love it. I love it. This has been excellent. Um, and I really love that you shared, you know, like I've, I've hit the million dollar portfolio, but I'm also not retired yet. Like I have a goal for 2024 and then even still, you know, it's work optional in 2024 that you'll continue on forward. Um, cause I think sometimes we glamorize a number so much that it's like, mm -hmm. Oh, if I had a million dollars right now, I could just go kick my feet up. And, you know, people make these assumptions, but they probably haven't really done the math to understand like what they would need to live. And that, you know, a million dollars could be a game changer for your financial situation, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're retired right then there on the spot. Um, especially if you're a young professional in the, in the millennial in your thirties or twenties, um, it's, it's something to think about, like how much do you actually need to be able to live, you know, till you're 90 or whenever. Right. Right. And healthcare, for example, is something that is like super huge. Yeah. I think it's also like one of those things of, um, you know, when we knew we were going to get close, like we were, uh, look, in 2016, we started our journey and I cannot deny that the stock market has been on fire, right? Like it's just been crazy. Like, I don't think we ever anticipated it, um, accelerating our path to financial independence or being work optional in the way that it did. Um, but when we hit that $1 million mark, it wasn't any different than when we hit the $900,000 mark, mm. right? It was kind of like, you know, like it was, it was cool, but I was like looking at our accounts and I'm like, I had a stained t-shirt, a hole in my sock, you know, and it was just like, <laughs> you know, it was just like, look, I, I was really proud, but it was also like, okay, it's not the end of the journey. Like, um, I feel like when we hit like $250,000, I felt more excitement because I felt, I finally felt financially secure and financially mm. confident. And I feel like that can come at any point, right? That can come when you're debt free, when your net, <laughs> when your net worth is at zero, right? Yeah. Um, and you're just debt free, or when you save your first $10,000. So really think about what is the feeling that you want to feel? Um, because the number, it is just a number. It is just a number. Wally, this has been excellent. I'd like to wrap up with what we like to call our final sprint. Um, so I'm going to rapid fire some questions at you. You go ahead and answer any way you want. Are you ready? Absolutely. Let's go. <laughs> What's your worst money habit? Um, right now, because I have a dog, I unfortunately spend a lot of money on like toys and things for him right now. So he's a puppy still. So <laughs> right now it's that. <laughs> okay. Tell us about your best money habit. Um, I'm a good saver. I wasn't that way. I talked about how I was like spending every dollar before, but I think now I know what I value and I enjoy making money in the stock market. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Why aren't you worried about people knowing about your millionaire status? Um, I think it's, we need more people who look like us who've achieved it. Um, and you know, I think that the more that we can inspire people, like, look, like I did it, you did it too. I hope it's more of an inspiration. I love it. Finish this sentence. That awkward financial moment when? 
I was at Blockbuster Video and they told me that my account had went to collections. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. Uh, at Blockbuster is a throwback. <laughs> I think most of our audience knows Blockbuster. <laughs> we were all here. Somebody told me the other day, you know, we're older than Google, right? And I was like, no, I'm, oh, wait, I am older than Google. Yes. <laughs> yeah. All right. You have $20 in your pocket right now. What do you spend it on? Oh, I got to go grocery shopping. So today it's grocery shopping, but normally it's hair products. I spend a lot of money on hair products. Okay. Everybody's got their thing. Right. <laughs> All right. Last question. What is one thing that you would like to improve about your finances in the upcoming year? I actually want to improve spending a little bit more. Mm. What is the action item to help you get to that goal? Um. Yeah, I think it's just making the the time for it. I think one of the things that I enjoy doing again is travel. And so I want to not be so penny pinching when it comes to like enjoy, you know, enjoying food, the experiences while I'm traveling. I think I may have cut down a little bit too much on that area and there's no need for me to do that anymore. Yeah. Uh, people sometimes take for granted the idea that, um, you know, there's, we, we talk a lot about spending too much, but we don't talk about saving too much or being too mm. um, aggressive or kind of holding yourself in prison by like, ah, I'm saving and I don't know what to spend. And I'm a penny pitcher. Like so the, that, that is also a mindset, you know, um, sometimes it's referred to as even like wealth guilt. Um, have you heard of the term and like thought any, anything about that? Oh yeah. Um, I actually wrote an article and it's usually like, one of the the top ranking articles, you know, within like the first top three or something on wealth guilt and overcoming it. That was something that I really dealt with when I um, uh, started making really good money and I was making more money than my parents had ever made. And um, I really struggled with that a lot um, because I saw the people who I love the most working really hard and not being able to move forward. And so I had a lot of guilt over that. Um, I think even sometimes now, like, I think I'm like, great, awesome. Like I, we've hit this million dollar portfolio. I'm super excited, but I think it's also helped, um, help me shape what is important to me and like use the same tools that I use to build my own wealth to build generational wealth. Mm. So like, instead of like buying toys and clothes and things for my nieces and nephews, I'm like buying stocks (laughs) for them. And I have investment accounts for them. I'm like, why can't they be little millionaires too? You know? I love it. I love it. Um, yeah, we all have to find a proper way to be able to deal with, uh, whatever money emotions we're having and wealth guilt being one of them. And like you said, even if it's like, manifesting itself in the form of saving too much or, you know, not living a Mm -hmm. life that is actually free despite having financial freedom. So, uh, yeah, this has been excellent. We have made it to the finish line. You are standing on the podium. Here is your medal for the worth listening podcast. It is now your time to shine. Um, please do tell us where we can find you, how we can support you, what you're up to. Uh, yeah, go for it. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am most active on Instagram, so you can follow me there, which is financially underscore thriving, or just visit me on the website. You can find all the socials and things like that, which is financially thriving.com. As I mentioned, I uh, help other women, right? Feel empowered when it comes to their money and feel confident. So if you're looking for um, like a financial coach, feel free to reach out to me. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Wally. Thank you for having me.